All right, we're back for, uh, this is part three. Part one, we did the, the laying out. Part two, we, uh, we did the, part one, we did the laying out and the cut in and went over strap cutting and things like that. And now we're gonna go over, we did the tooling. Uh, and what we're gonna go over now, and this part's gonna be harder for me to film because I can't get this camera over in position where my finishing bench is. So I hate to do it here at this bench. This is my tooling area, but I'm gonna have to. And uh, we'll see how in depth we go on this. But basically on this particular project, it's gonna be all natural except for there's gonna, it's gonna be antique. And what we're gonna use for antique is we're gonna use Phoebe's I'm going to use a medium brown antique paste on this. Now, she wants the natural leather color to show through. So if, if we just, you can just wipe this on, but it's going to dye it, of course. And uh, you're not going to have the same look. We're going for more of a, I guess, I guess it's a single tone antique. Um, that's how it would be, because if we, it would be dual toned if we were to dye this outside portion and then you'd have the natural leather color here and you can make a tritone by dyeing the background but this basically I, I guess would be considered a single tone so it's a little more basic but in order to preserve this natural leather color which will darken over time we have to seal this with something and uh, there's several different products you can use uh, a lot of people use acrylics um, I use acrylics. Um, this RT, RTC is be nat, by be natural is uh, is some great stuff here. Um, I use this a lot um, for different things. I don't really use it in this because I have to have I have to give it time to dry. But uh, another thing people use is they use mop and glow. Mop and glow is it's based in acrylic. Um, you can get that at any store, any, uh, in the floor cleaning section and stuff like that. Anyways, Mop and Glow works. This RTC works. And I'm not endorsing any one brand over another. Here's some Anglis. Uh, you could use this. But this, any of these acrylics are going to require an extended dry time. Um, Usually I'm trying to push things through the shop, so uh, if I have time, I'll use these. And I also use a lot of uh, a lot of this when I'm uh, sealing over the top of paints, especially whites um, and stuff. Anyways, I, I use a lot of this for that, but not so much for sealing my projects. But you definitely can. It's easier to use zero zero. Uh, you know it doesn't have any smell to it and uh, you can apply it with a dauber you can uh, get a, a rag I like to use a just a slightly damp rag and wipe it on and you want to wipe it on fairly heavy and there'll be bubbles but those bubbles will pop and settle out and that'll seal this project so that this so this this antique paste only gets down in the grooves which is what we're trying to accomplish here what I'm going to use is I'm going to use some clear lac, and uh, there was a, I'm drawing a blank on the other name, uh, Wyosh, Wyosheen, was it Wyosheen is what it was branded under before, but this is called clear lac, and uh, it's a lacquer um, base, it's kind of a flexible lacquer, but uh, I'm going to use it, and I'm going to use it because, and I use it out of a, uh, have an airbrush so here's the container that goes on the bottom of my airbrush and uh, I just I blow this on there and that's gonna have a hundred percent seal on it and it'll be dry in about 15 minutes uh, 20 minutes or so you give it 30 minutes just to be sure but uh, unless your your uh, work area is ice cold or something then that might be a problem but basically the way things are in this shop about 20 minutes and it's pretty dry dry to the touch and uh, and uh, then it's ready for the antique 
Now, I'm not going to show the application of this. Now, if you had a can of this, you could apply it with a dauber. Um, you know, you're not going to want to use a wet cloth because it is lacquer, but you could apply this with a dauber and you'd be just fine. I'm going to use an airbrush just because it's fast. And I'm not going to be able to show that that part because it happens outside and I just don't have time to reset all this camera up for that. So I'm going to take this outside and I'm going to spray this and then we'll come back. All right. All right. So I'm back. It actually hasn't been only about 10 minutes or so, but it's 100 degrees plus outside, I believe. So uh, it's drying pretty fast. But uh, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but uh, my tooling leather, I pretty much just use Herman Oak. Um, there's other good leathers out there. Some of the imports aren't that bad, but I just prefer Herman Oak. Now, I will use some imports to, to back it, or I may just use Herman Oak. But either way, so this is sealed pretty well now. Sometimes it will require two coats. We're not going to go with two coats on this. And you might have noticed I didn't put any oil in this. And uh, if you oil it, it's going to darken it. And this is going to darken over time anyways. You can hang this in a closet and come back in a year and it's going to be 20 shades darker than it is now. And if you put it out in the sun, this will tan just like, uh, just like your skin. You can set this out in direct sun. If I set this out in direct sun for just a little while, uh, I don't have anything right here. I can grab to show you but it's gonna turn that uh, let me grab it real quick I'll be right back okay so this is not this is not dyed but you can see how much darker this is and this is a belt someone ordered and they ordered it way too long and it's been sitting around here they paid to have another one made because it was their mistake but this one's been hanging out here in the shop for forever so uh, if you're a rather uh, larger person and you need an extra large size I got a belt sitting here waiting for you anyhow it will turn this color uh, over time or you can set it out in the Sun and it'll turn that color just it don't take very long at all so uh, this leather will tan just like your skin will in the in the in the Sun especially this Oklahoma Sun but anyhow you can speed that process up by oiling this and it's just it's not necessary you don't need to oil it um, but so we're gonna try and do this here at this bench which is an ideal but uh, so I'm gonna have to now when you're doing this uh, like this is the belt keeper and I didn't do anything with that I should have but uh, you want to run it through the same processes that you would that but I'll have time for that because I'm going to put another coat over the top of the antique if you don't put another coat of something over the top of the antique and I prefer to use the same thing I use the clear lac and the reason for that is is uh, if you let this if you let the antique dry completely then you can get away with wiping some over it but it will smear some of that antique and if you don't put anything over the antique, uh, when it gets wet and stuff, it's you're going to rehydrate it, and uh, it, it can make a mess. So you, you will want to seal that antique, at least this particular. And there's other kinds of antiques out there, um, but this is this is what I what I use and I like. So we'll come back to that belt keeper later. All right. So let's put some paper towels down here try not to make a big mess all over my tooling bench and the glue up the glue up is going to be a little bit of a challenge also because uh, where my bench is where I glue things up that's uh, make sure this is in frame that's a little bit of a uh, problem to set the tripod up also I am in the process of building a 1600 square foot new leather shop and uh, concrete pads in the framing is 99% done um, it's just so hot now and it's a pay-as-you-go kind of build 
so it's been a little slow going but uh i'll have this winter i will have the framing done and i'll have it all sheeted and closed in and then after that it's just a matter of you know the remainder of the stages i'm going to have a i already got the power dropped and all that kind of stuff so we're we got all that done and uh that took forever to get the power company out here to do that and i'm gonna grab some gloves real quick i don't always wear gloves but if i'm spraying stain i'll always wear them but when i'm hand dyeing and stuff like that i usually don't but okay so there really isn't much to this we have our project sealed and i'm running kind of low here i got a brand new jug over there but you can apply this with a piece of wool or uh as a matter of fact I'll grab something sorry i didn't prepare very well for this little section didn't have everything together and you're just going to apply this liberally to uh, to your project. I like to do it in sections. Wipe it right back off. And you're going to start scrubbing excess. off your project and you can see how that antique sets in all these little impressions that you made and really makes things jump out so I'll usually take a piece of sheep wool this is synthetic sheep wool I prefer to use the real deal I just didn't grab that piece I grabbed this one I'll buff it out a little bit like that and then I'll just take the next section and do exactly the same thing until we make it all the way to the other end Like it to get all down inside all the different little crooks and crevices and down inside all that tooling wipe off the bulk of it and then start scrubbing have a spot that doesn't have quite enough antique in it put a little more all right and what the wool does is it gets down in the crevices and takes a little bit of that extra out of there you don't want it gunked on there you don't want a big bunch of excess on there and that's it other than uh, we'll put a little bit on the makers mark just to make that stand out all right And that is all there is to this type of antiquing. The only thing you're going to do after this, as far as finish, is after your are 
after you're all done then we're gonna seal this but that's gonna come after the edges are finished and all that that will be the final thing the final seal on it which will seal all that in so we're gonna go to the next step and the next step is gonna be gluing the backing on this piece that we just antiqued so I'm gonna get set up for that we're gonna also do that here which is gonna be a little awkward uh, normally I would do that in a in a full side and uh, lay it on there and glue it up and and I would do it that way it's faster and I can do half a dozen or a dozen belts at a time not all tools I don't normally do a dozen or half a dozen tool belts at a time um, I don't do that but uh, I do a lot of other belts that don't require tooling so I do quite a few at a time but we're just going to do this single one and I'll be right back okay I'm set up here best I can and the next step that I do is gluing the backer on now this is a piece of four to five ounce you can use two to three you know whatever you want to use depends on how thick you want it we uh we did this is all skived down here uh we ran it through the the, the bench splitter and uh split this down so it's not going to be too thick at the buckle end you've seen that in part part one but uh we got our glue here and basically uh i use contact cement this stuff really stinks but it holds like nothing else um, i don't know if it really matters there's two main brands that i use so i use weldwood and i use masters and if you can see that in the picture but just masters i buy this by the gallon i usually order anywhere from five to ten gallons at a time because i go through a lot of it so um i've already gone through here and i marked an outline of where our glue needs to be so uh this is going to be a little bit of a problem because uh <laughs> i don't have much room here uh in fact i think i'm going to put I'll, I'll just do it like this so we're just going to apply our glue this is just a standard glue pot you're going to see in any leather shop um, they make different ones they make ones that seal really really well uh, for hobbyists that don't do a tremendous amount of gluing or they have long periods in between getting into their glue um, My glue never sets around that long sometimes i fill this pot up a couple couple three times a day in the shop depending on what i'm doing um, i may get out of frame here a little bit i'm just putting glue on this other end and uh now like i said early earlier i would normally have this in uh I'd normally have a whole side of leather out there that I just whatever side I'm using at the time I, that's what I use for my backing material till it's all used up and this is actually the the end piece of that which has worked out pretty good that I had it I don't cut strips so a lot of people they'll cut a if they're making an inch and a half belt they'll cut an inch and three quarter strip I just don't do that I just do it right on right on the side of leather because cutting a strip is just another it's just another step that isn't necessary now if you're a hobbyist then you may want to do that because you don't want to get glue on the back side of your other leather that you may be using for a project where you don't want that to show but in my case that's the, in my situation that's not the case I uh, have whole sides that um, I mean there's a bundle over there that's that's uh, probably got uh, five six sides of this maybe more um, end it in it that uh, it's there just for doing nothing but but uh, belt backs so and normally this is a very fast procedure but I uh, don't really want to get glue all over my bench my tooling bench and hopefully I'm in frame right there okay yeah you guys can see it it may not be perfect but you guys can see it and most of you leather workers are gonna gonna know this uh, these parts here but if you're new 
like I was at one time, like we all were, then you just don't know, you know. Um, so I don't want to leave anything out, which I'm sure that I probably am, but after I review it, I'll write down some notes and on the next one, uh, because all these are different. There's a lot of different patterns uh, that I'd like to show, eventually show tooling, so you can see how, how I do those. Um, and also finishes, uh, a dual color, tri-color, uh, tri-color and antique. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of variations. Some of them have paint on them, uh, acrylics, some of them don't. Um, one thing about acrylics, uh, in my experience, eventually, now I, there's a whole, we'll get into that in another one, but there's a whole way to go about putting acrylics on something like a belt that's going to make the acrylic last as long as it can on the belt but uh you know belts get a lot of wear and uh acrylics don't always hold up forever on there eventually they eventually they will wear off i mean eventually you wear uh, just you know you wear down in the leather a little bit and uh, of course paint's not going to hold up as good as, as leather will but it can stay looking nice for quite a while but not forever okay we're gonna let this dry and I'm actually gonna on this particular thing here and I don't always do it but um, sometimes on that first coat and that's how it's feeling on here it'll soak in the leather and there won't be once it dries there won't be much sticky on there so you can get away with just sticking this down. It'll probably never go anywhere. I prefer to use two coats. And uh, regardless of which, uh, which uh, contact cement I'm using. Now, I will tell you one thing about Masters. It dries a lot faster than weld wood, so it can up your production time. Um, I have a hot box also that I put things in to speed drying along. Um, and all that is is just it's a kitchen cabinet. It's got two light bulbs down the bottom of it And a friend of mine George Canfield actually made it and gave it to me um, He was the first one that turned me on to that. So that was a good on him. He uh, if you guys haven't checked out his channel uh, EDC leather or EDC leather.com uh, He's got they do a lot of holsters and other things and they got a YouTube channel. That's that's actually doing pretty well in leather so um, check them out they're good guys so anyways we're gonna let this this set up a little bit more not much more it's almost almost there now and uh, I'm gonna throw another coat on it we'll let that tack up because you definitely want you don't want to just put with any contact cement you got to let it dry to the point where it at least where it tacks up you can't put it together wet um, you can and eventually it'll dry but you'll never have the bond that, that you'll have letting it tack up and by putting two coats on this putting it together how I'm going to show you to put it together um, you could never get it apart you'd absolutely destroy whatever it is that you're trying to get apart um, once it, if it's glued properly so we'll be back in a few minutes and we'll take it up from there okay we're back it's pretty well tacked up we've got two coats of uh, of our contact cement on there and I'm not sure if you can see this but we got this all marked out so all we're going to do is stick this down to our piece. We just put the glue on and then smash it down best we can. And then I like to take a cobbler's hammer, which is a smooth face hammer, and I like to knock along my edges and all that's doing is assuring that we have a tight no 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 spaces anywhere between our two pieces of the leather that's all it's doing it that's all there is to that 
and get our cutting board out. And we're going to cut. This is kind of an awkward place. This isn't where I normally cut at. Just have to bear with me here. One thing I've figured out shooting these videos is that anything you're doing is going to be kind of awkward because you have to contend with the tripod and um, articulating arms that's holding the camera and, and uh, things that are just in the way. So if it looks a little awkward then that's why. There's nothing to this, and, and a lot of people will use a head knife uh, a lot in the shop. I don't even own a head knife. I did, and I sold it. I cut everything in the shop for the most part with this razor knife. I made my living before before leather using a razor knife, so. Continuing on doing that today. And you just want to let your blade run right along the edge there so that you got a nice flush cut. And you want that nice flush cut because when we sand it, we don't want a whole bunch of extra sanding to do. off there throw that aside I'm gonna go around this one more time just to make sure I didn't miss anything the tighter that bond is the nicer the edge is gonna be and edges can be done a lot of different I got a video that kind of I'm gonna redo it because the video shooting wasn't that great but kind of went over edges how I like to do them and you have to decide for yourself just how far you're gonna take your edges but uh, you get another little tip here if you've got little dirty spots on the back of your belt or whatever it is you can get a lot of that off with which I got some glue on here, which normally wouldn't happen, but being as where we are. Magic Racer works great for cleaning up that. So, okay. Um, we're going to go over, I'm going to try and set this camera up. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, but uh, go over so we can set it up to go over the sanding. And basically all we're going to do is because I got two different sanders, so I've got a drum sander that's that is a Harbor Freight makeup that is the sandpaper was 120 to start out with. It's wore down after that. That's my second stage. First stage is a wore out belt uh, sander, which was 120 or I believe grit, and it's pretty well wore out, and I keep it that way. Um, but it's still heavier than what the drums are, and uh, that'll do my initial. That'll do my initial uh, leveling here, and you don't want to gouge in there and take big chunks out. You're not trying to sand all the way through it. You're just trying to even up these edges and smooth them out. And sanding, if you want nice, acceptable commercial type edges or any kind of edge, it doesn't matter if you're doing something completely custom and they want an absolute mirror finish edge, in my opinion, the secret to that, uh, the biggest part of it is the sanding. So if you never if you never get it sanded right to begin with, you're not going to have a good edge at the end. So um, we'll, well, I'll, I'll turn this thing, uh, I'll pause this and I'll try and get this over to the sander, no guarantees, but I'll try and do that so I can film some of that real quick. All right. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not even 100% sure that I'm in frame. So we're going to do this quick. Here's a belt sander, here's a drum sander I talked to you about. Hopefully you guys are going to be able to see all this. 
Um, it's going to be loud enough as it is, so I've got uh, chop back running in the back of this to gather up some of the dust. I also use this shop back, which gathers up dust because it does get incredibly dusty in here. Uh, but I'll leave that off. It's going to be loud enough. If you have earphones in, uh, it's going to get loud. So hopefully they don't blow your eardrums out. We'll just do a quick sanding here. I'm not pressing super hard. Hope you can see that, but it's even in that edge up real nice. to on on that stage we will uh, there probably won't be but uh I got to get up on a stool to even see it. I got the camera up so high. Okay, we're back over here at the tooling bench. This is a step that's not completely necessary. Um, I do it. Uh, you can use your pressure foot on sewing machine to, to regulate where that comes down. I draw a line on there. Um, now, if you're a hobbyist, you're probably not going to have a big commercial sewing machine that can sew this thick of leather, um, or probably any kind of leather. But uh, so you may be, um, if I was, I used to do nothing but hand stitch for a couple of years. I done nothing but hand stitch, and I don't know how many miles and miles and miles, literally miles of hand stitching I've done, but uh, it's a lot. And I usually use, when I'm doing that, I like the looks of using a diamond chisel like this here. And basically, if you have your line here, you'd run that diamond chisel down and punch that in, and punch that in, and punch that in. And then you would do, you would do a saddle stitch with your thread in and out of each hole um, all the way around. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's probably not a better stitch than 
than a saddle stitch done that way. But in a professional shop, it's just not realistic to expect to keep up with with the demand, order demand, in stitching by hand. It's just that's just not realistic. So you can debate whether or not uh, it's it's a custom piece of handmade piece of leather. Uh, goods if you're using a sewing machine or not. I'm not going to get into that debate. I already have the answer to it And I'm not going to debate it with anybody Okay, so we got our line marked there and what we're going to do next we're going to go over the sewing machine I'll go ahead and show you guys some of that. I use a Cobra class 4 um, sewing machine I've used it for years and I will have to change We're going to use white thread so I'm gonna have to go change my thread I will do that and set you guys up over there and I'll let you watch me uh, sew this or at least part of it. So I'll be right back. Okay, we're back over here at the sewing machine. Um, I got you set up the best I, I think I can. Um, I'm sorry for having to go back and forth turned off and on. I don't, I have, I don't really have time to do video editing at this point. So I just have to kind of roll with it put together what I can as I go and then upload it so however it turns out it turns out hopefully that'll change in the future but we'll see all right so we're going to spin around here and see if I can keep my head out of the out of the picture Now this glue hasn't had time to dry and sometimes when that happens it can cause a, the sewing machine to act a little goofy. Hopefully that's not the case here. Now you can see where this little foot is right here. It's running right on this edge right here. And you can use that to line up your line up your stitches. It'll be just fine. And a, a lot of people do that. But uh, I have a tendency to have wondering thoughts. <laughs> so it's just better off if I have a line to follow. And I don't always draw one, but it only takes a second to spin around there, although it is an extra step, but it only takes a second to spin around there. Now, if I had time to do some video editing, then I would, uh, Stop right now and do a little fast forward thing to the end which would be cool but like I said I don't have time for all that at this point in my in my life so in an effort to make content and have something that people might be helpful to people then I just gotta either not do it or go with what I got And we're going to touch lightly on uh, the remainder of the edge finishing, which the only thing we got left to do on this belt is just finish the edge and uh, put the final finish coat on it, install the buckle and it's ready to go it will be going out in the middle tomorrow and I've got a stack of uh, I think I counted them earlier 15 more projects that are gonna go 
ranging anything from wallets to rifle slings to buffalo leather belts and um, veg tan belts, just different different stuff. Some of them there's knife sheets and stuff won't take a tremendous amount of time. Um, some of the rifle slings are rattlesnake inlay type slings. Um, those don't take a tremendous amount of time either, but they do take a little time. And you just sew on around here. This segment's obviously going to be longer than I would have preferred, so I'm probably only going to show a only going to show finishing a sh short section of the edge because it's all the same all the way down. So, and like I said, we've already started we've already started our edge by getting the sanding done, which is a big part of it, and that only took. I showed you the whole sanding process. It really didn't take that long, but it's uh, important to have the right sanding set up so you can get a well sanded edge. All right, so. We're just going to run over the top of our stitch there and then back up one or two just to lock it in and that's going to be the end of the stitching. Now I'm not sure how long that took. I didn't time it, didn't look, but uh, I don't run my sewing machine super fast because if it misses a stitch I want to be able to catch it. And now this, I sewed this with, uh, this is 277 on top and 207 on the bottom. That's what I'm running. I sewed just about everything with that. I like that big heavy stitch. Um, we'll move you back over to the bench and we'll start working on these edges. Okay, we are back and working on our edges. Now, thing we're gonna do first with the edges We've already sanded them, They're stitched. I like to dampen this edge. Damp leather always cuts better than dry leather. It's always going to cut easier. Okay. Not trying to saturate it I'm just trying to get a little moisture in it because we're going to be putting moisture in this edge anyways when we're doing the burnishing so there's that these are Berry King bevelers this here is a number three it could definitely use some sharpening to be honest with you, I hardly ever grabbed these when they couldn't use some sharpening. And the way I sharpen it was just on a buffing wheel. I might do a short video of that sometime, but not today. The if you're gonna spend some money on tools. At least buy you a good beveler. You don't need all the ones I got. I basically use a two and a three. And a regular beveler like this. And also on a closed radius beveler like this. I use both those very often. Or most often. So if you get a cheap, uh, cheap one from one of the other leather suppliers, it costs about eight or ten dollars or less. A lot of those, I, those things hurt me more than anything in the shop. These were extremely sharp on those, and you'd slip off because it's dull you, and it's terrible steel. You can never get them sharp, and even if you do, they won't stay that way for longer than one pass. So, uh, 
spend some money get you a decent beveler I gotta snip those I gotta snip these uh, strings off steel okay so that's it for the beveling Sorry about that, but I took my big arm right in front of that. And now we are going to go with uh, times off. Smash those stitches down. With again with my smooth face hammer. Okay. All right, so I'll put a little bit more moisture in here. And then we're gonna use these with just water. Hold on just one second. Okay, sorry about that. The UPS was here and I had to go collect my orders or my deliveries. And all you're gonna do at this point is just some elbow grease just like this. And what I'll also do is um, take this tool and I like to rub the edge. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, it's not something that everyone else, everyone does, but So I've got a problem here that I've just noticed that I didn't notice when I was sewing it. And uh, so it can even happen to, it can happen to any of us. But apparently I have a bottom tension problem and I've got some loose stitches. So I'm gonna pause you guys again for the 300th time and I'm gonna pull these stitches and I'm gonna redo that because that's not gonna fly. So I will be right back. Okay, I'm back. That was not ideal. Um, what happened was uh, I was looking around the camera there and trying to make sure I was in focus. I wasn't paying attention to what was happening and somehow or another my top tension got backed out uh, all the way out. So it uh, made for some loose stitches. Um, so I cut those stitches out and restitched it. And the stitching is nice and tight now and away we go we all make mistakes doesn't matter how long we've been doing this uh, things can happen but I don't know if you can see this but uh, see how that looks then when you run this over it, it just burnishes that edge and slicks it up really well You just do that all the way around. I do that with just water. That's it. And like I said, I do like to come around with my smaller one. And I just, I'm burnishing that edge right there. And that just cleans it up, hardens it a little bit. same thing to the back side and we're 
here it's getting a nice burnished edge I was reading over the order and it's not clear if she wanted a black edge or not so uh, I'm gonna have to send her a message or make a quick phone call and get that detail without the black background I prefer not to do the black edge just leave it all natural so that's that right there and I'm gonna do the same thing to the other edge and I don't know if you can see that or not but uh when you got a pretty nice edge there you can see where the two leathers come together but you're gonna see part of that now I'm gonna I'm gonna put some saddle soap on this and I'm gonna slick it one more time and that's just gonna slick it just that much more but uh, I'm gonna slick this other side come back we'll do the saddle soap and then uh, we'll do our final finish on it and we'll be done okay one more step in our edge finishing here now, I don't use any of the edge slicking solutions any of that stuff I've used them in the past and I found they're just simply not necessary this is saddle soap glycerin saddle soap it is uh, this right here Phoebe's glycerin saddle soap the edge is already damp from burnishing it with water normally I wouldn't be doing this right here because this is my tooling bench so I'll make sure that I clean this bench really well but let me show you how I do this I use the same I actually have a second one of these that I use that saddle soap makes a big difference on your edge I don't know if you can see that but I mean that it's hard to get a better edge than that especially natural and if you were to dye that black I mean well you'd see nothing <laughs> so it is slick as could be and good sanding and good prep work putting your putting your piece together when you're gluing it will give you that and it's even easier if you're doing just a single layer like this you know because you don't have you don't have the two layers you're trying to camouflage or hide so this is our belt keeper and after I get that done there I'll tell you something else we can do just to dress this up a little bit Take our wing divider, put a couple lines down this real quick. There's a little bit of moisture in that, and that will hold there. And we'll just add a little, little bit of character to that. A little something extra. So you just come back and clean off all that excess. There's not a tremendous amount of excess. Um, some people have buffed this part with canvas and all that kind of stuff. I just wipe off the saddle soap and we're pretty much pretty much good to go there. I mean it's hard to beat that. Once the finish goes on that, man. Okay, I'm gonna finish the other side the same way as I just finished this. And then uh, I'm gonna go out and put the spray the final finish coat on. I'm gonna use the same thing I used to seal it which you can do the same thing whatever you choose to use um, I'm just gonna spray that real quick I don't I won't spray the back side I'll just spray this front side and this edge uh, real quick let that dry I'll come back and we'll fill the buckle on it and then we will then we'll actually be done okay so we're back we got our final finish on it and we just have a couple more things to finish up our belt so it's ready to ship and I'll try and make it fast because this segment has already ran an hour 
it's her belt keeper. I'm just going to check the length to make sure it's okay and it's fine. We put a finish, some finish on this also. And uh, I don't know what size these holes are. They're some of the smallest, uh, one of the smallest in this rotary punch. And we're just punching these holes about an eighth of an inch from the end. And we're going to use, hopefully I'm, I was in frame there. We're going to use these uh, staples. I prefer this type of staple over the stapler staple. Um, they're not going to show on this, but they do show on other projects that I use. And they're just a, I, I just think that they look nicer um, than a regular staple. Um, so I'm having a hard time here. And I have worked on other projects along with this belt today. Uh, I got multiple knife sheaths going over there and a couple of wallets. And as things are drying in production shops, you got to do that so that when some things are drying, you're working on something else. And that's just how that, just how that goes in a production shop. So, okay, so we're going to punch our holes here. They're already marked and we're marked for our slot. And, uh, I'm punching these at 7 30 seconds hole. And that's going to be for our uh, screw post to go through. And this is going to be our slot for our, our little uh, point on our thing to go through here. So we'll slide that on. Run that through. This will bend over. Hopefully I'm in frame. That might have been out. I'm trying to hurry this along. Now I some once they get the bu their buckle they want on it. Some people use this buckle. Some people uh she's gonna be putting a different buckle that she has. She sent pictures and measurements and all the rest of that stuff. She was really concerned about the buckle she was going to put on it. Sometimes you get these and they'll have burrs on them. And that may be either I'm not getting it lined up right or it's got burrs on it. I believe that one's got burrs on it. Oh, it's always something, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, here's some, there's some more here. I had another one and I don't know exactly what I've done with it. So. When you're in a hurry, nothing seems to go right. And that little fiasco with the loose stitching didn't help things either. That took about half an hour to cut all them stitches out of there and get it restitched. So. You don't get that time back. So, customers almost always want a buckle. They want to be able to replace and change buckles. It's almost always the case. So we got that. And I'll throw these in there and get them out of the way. One more step to do. And then we're done. So this uh I believe EDC leather, this came from EDC leather. George made this for me, but uh I believe that uh he has those on his website. Now what I'm using is actually an inch shorter than what this tongue is. I used to use a little longer tongue and I don't use that anymore. But uh, so I got a mark on there. And when I originally cut this, I already used this and cut it to length. So try and mark these. Sometimes they're hard to see. 
and we're gonna go back to that seven seven thirty seconds punch. And I believe this is 32 inches and the center hole is gonna be our 32 inch mark. So there should be one here. This one is right in that little spot right there and that oops, that's like falling everywhere is going to complete our belt build and uh, I'll take some pictures of this thing and uh, and it'll be ready to ship so that's it hand tool belt start to finish every every uh, little point of that should be on there hopefully I didn't forget anything um, so there you go I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it if you did Hit the like and subscribe button. It's greatly appreciated. It helps the channel. Helps people find the channel. Um, helps me in the long run. I got lots of different content. I got a bunch more stuff coming. Um, everything from uh, leather, more leather work, flint napping. Uh, if you're a leather worker and you're checking this out and you've never checked out flint napping, check it out. It's a pretty neat hobby. Um, yeah, it might interest you. Um, who knows? You might become a Flint Napper yourself. It was kind of a resurgence of that, resurgence of that in the country um, over the last I don't know, 15, 20 years or so. It's been a lot of Flint Nap people taking back, taking it back up. And uh, same with leather. I mean, uh, about 15 years ago or so, people, leather kind of leather working really took off, and and uh, now there's a ton of people out there doing it. So. Thank you all for watching. Hit that like and subscribe button. And then we'll see you all next time. I don't know what the next video will be, but we'll have some more. Thank you.